today on Grace To You. So Jesus is actually praying for a unity in the church that is essential, like the very unity of the Trinity. This is how the church is to live in the world. Let that invisible unity be visible. Start by humbling yourself. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I want you to turn to the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and we're talking about this particular section of verses 1 through 6. So let me read it for you, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all." Now last time we, we introduced this passage, and I told you at the time that it's a very, very important transitional passage as indicated by the word, therefore, at the beginning of verse 1. The first three chapters have been doctrinal in their emphasis as Paul has laid out the, the divine truth for us related to the gospel and the unity of the church. And now there is a transition from that which is doctrinal to that which has to do with our duty. So therefore, based upon all that doctrine that has been unfolded in the first three chapters, we are told that we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Now for three chapters, Paul has delineated our calling, our divine calling, our calling from heaven which brought us into God's kingdom, which ushered us out of death into life. We are called, and now we are to live lives worthy of that calling. We have been called to become sons of God. We have been called to become children of God. We have been called out of death into life, out of darkness into light, out of deception into truth, and you know all those realities. And now that that has happened, we ought to live lives that are consistent with that new identity. We are in Christ, and we should walk in a manner worthy of that reality. Now notice that Paul does use the word implore or beg, and I would just remind you that there's, a, there's an, an element of Christian ministry that pushes us all, including you as well as me, into being a beggar. We are beggars, but we're not begging for ourselves. We're begging for people to reach out and take what God is offering them. I think sometimes we may look at our evangelistic opportunity as some kind of a cold, calculating, straight-up conversation, and if it doesn't go anywhere, you just say, well, there wasn't any interest. That wouldn't work with the Apostle Paul. Paul was a beggar, and he was used to pleading and begging with sinners, and that's what the original verb there means. And he, he begged for people to listen to the gospel. He begged for people to be saved. He begged for them not to reject it. He begged for people to follow His example, to love others, to live in the freedom Christ had given them, and He begged believers to walk in a worthy way, consistent with their identity in Christ. This is a matter of what our Lord said when He said that you are to be holy way back in the book of Leviticus as I am holy. And Peter picks that up, doesn't he, in his epistle, be holy for I am holy. This is how we are to live. We are the children of God. We are to manifest the very nature of God planted within us. So we looked at that verse last time, and we looked at it from the vantage point of the call to the worthy walk, and it was a divine call 
from God Himself. Now I want to take it a little further, not very much further, but a little further. Look at verse 2. It says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now you will remember, if you've been with us, that all through the second half of chapter 2, all through chapter 3, unity was the issue. The, the, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is calling for the church to be one, to manifest its unity, unity that it already possesses spiritually and needs to manifest in terms of its conduct and behavior. So we're going to look in verses 2, 3 at how we get to that kind of manifest unity. And it all starts with this, verse 2. Here's the beginning with all humility. So if you're going to walk in a worthy way, you start with all humility, with all humility. So when we're thinking about this idea of walking worthy, when we're thinking about sanctification, here's where you start, okay? Here's where you start. You start with all humility. That's the beginning. In other words, the worthy walk is a walk that demands, at the very outset, humility. This is a major reality in the believer's life and a major factor in the unity of the church. And I want to show you that in the highest way that I can, I can show you. In John 17, I, I want you to look at it, John 17, we're going to look at the Gospel of John in a few places to illustrate this. But in John 17, our Lord prays for those who are His disciples and those who will be His disciples in the future. But I want you to notice His prayer down in verse 21. He prays that they may all be one, that they may all be one. Even as You, Father, are in Me and I in You, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that You sent Me." This is amazing. He's praying that we would all be one in the same way that the Son and the Father are one. So in what way are the Son and the Father one? In nature, right? In essence. So He is praying here not for some external unity, not for some association, not for some get-along effort. He is praying that there will be a spiritual unity in the church that is like the spiritual union in the Trinity, that they may be one, even as You, Father, are in Me and I in You, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that You sent Me. The power of the church to demonstrate to the world that Christ is the Savior is when the world has the same kind, uh, when the church has the same kind of unity that the Father and the Son share. Look at verse 22, the glory which You have given Me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. You can tell He's not talking about something external, He's talking about something internal, something profound here. Just as the Father and the Son are one in nature and being, so He prays that the church would have that same spiritual common life. Verse 23 he goes further, I in them and you in me, and if you're in me and I am in them, then we're all one in Him, that they may be perfected in unity. In other words, it's a unity of, of essence. It's a unity of real life. It's the unity of the eternal life which is God, which dwells in the believer in the presence of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that the world, and He says it for the second time, may know that You sent Me and love them even as You have loved Me. How is the world going to know that Christ is the true Redeemer? How is the world going to know that God loves them when they see this unity? of life in the church. So this is a very profound thing. This is not organizational. 
This is not external in any sense. This is a spiritual union. So do you think that the Father answered that prayer? Are we not one with Christ? Are we not indwelt by the Father? Are we not indwelt by the Son? Are we not indwelt by the Spirit? Are we not one with each other? He that is joined to the Lord is one Spirit. We're one with Him and therefore one with each other. This is our common eternal life. We share the same life. So Jesus is actually praying for a unity in the church that is essential, that is like the very unity of the Trinity. And I'll give you an illustration of it. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. The Jews had confronted Jesus and were highly disturbed because He had broken their Sabbath. And this brought up the issue of why did He have a right to break the Sabbath? And Jesus gives them an answer that goes way beyond that. But what He does here is He talks about how He and the Father are one. The the whole conversation starting in chapter 5 at verse 16 and going on through that chapter and even beyond defines the way in which the Father and the Son are one. So let's look at it. Verse 15, verse, uh, let's start at verse 16. The Jews were persecuting Jesus because He was doing things on the Sabbath, which uh, you're not supposed to do. But He answered them, My Father is working until now, and I Myself am working. The Sabbath was never for Jesus. The Sabbath was made for man. It was never for Jesus. He and the Father were one in rights. The Sabbath put no limitation on the Father then it couldn't put a limitation on the Son. They are one in rights. Whatever the Father has a right to do, I have a right to do. And this catapulted them into verse 18 where they're seeking to kill Him because He was not only breaking the Sabbath but calling God His own Father, making Himself equal with God. They got it. He actually said, I have the same rights as God. That's Trinitarian unity. The Son and the Father have the same rights. Look at verse 19. They have the same purpose. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. They have the same purpose. They have the same rights. And they have the same objectives, the same goals, the same purpose. Thus they do the same things. Not only are, are they equal in rights and in purpose, but look at verse 21. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. They are one in power. They are one in power. The Father and the Son have the same divine power to raise the dead in this case. Verse 23, they are one in honor, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who doesn't honor the Son doesn't honor the Father who sent Him. One in rights, one in purpose, one in power, one in honor. Go down to verse 26, for just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave to the Son to have life in Himself. They are one in being the source of life. They are one in being the source of life. In verse 27, and He gave Him authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. They are one in authority. Whatever the Father has the right to do, the Son has the authority to do as well. They are one in will. Look at verse 30 of chapter 5, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will but the will of Him who sent me. This is, a, this is a stunning portion of Scripture where the Son saying, I and the Father are one in rights and purpose and power and honor, in the ability to give life in authority and in will. Down in verse 36, the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. They are equal in work. They are one in works. Down in verse 
43, they are one in name. I have come in My Father's name, and you do not receive Me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. I am one in name with the Father. That is to say, we come from the same eternal, divine, everlasting Godhead. If you go over to chapter 7 of John's gospel in verse 16, Jesus says, My teaching is not mine, but His who sent me. They're one in doctrine, one in doctrine. Over in chapter 12 of John's gospel, in verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in Me does not believe in Me, but in Him who sent Me. They are one in being the objects of saving faith. They are one in salvation. And then over to John 17, in verse 1, Jesus says, lifting up His eyes to heaven, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son that the Son may glorify You. Glorify Your Son that the Son may glorify You. They're one in glory. Now, this is, this is understanding the Trinity by the very words of Jesus, one in rights, one in purpose, one in power, one in honor, one in life-giving, one in authority, one in will, one in works, one in name, one in doctrine, one in salvation, and one in glory. And obviously, if we could go one step further, one in holiness. You say, what what is this all leading to? It's this. Jesus prays in John 17 that we may be one as the Son and the Father are one. It's not talking about a superficial kind of unity. It's talking about this profound spiritual reality where we are one with the very communion of the divine nature. Peter puts it this way. We are partakers of the divine nature. God lives in us. He dwells in us. This is the prayer our Lord is praying. And if that manifests itself the way it manifested itself in the Lord Jesus, then the world will know that God has sent us. The unity is very important. Being of one mind, one heart, one will, one purpose. We all partake of the divine nature. We are one in Christ, but it doesn't always show up. That's the sad thing. What's the path to make it visible, to get it from the invisible reality to the visible reality? And the answer, go back to Ephesians, the answer starts with all humility. If you want to walk in a manner, and walk means daily conduct, worthy of your divine calling and this incredible spiritual union with the Trinity, if you want to walk worthy, then start with all humility. It's a high calling with a lowly walk. That may seem a little bit counterintuitive. It's typically human to think that if you have some kind of elevated calling, then you should perhaps uh, make sure everybody else elevates you to the place where you belong. Sanctification starts with humbling yourself. All humility. All humility. And the humility word here is made up of two Greek words. One means to think or judge. The other means low. It could be poor, insignificant, unimportant, ignoble, cowardly. Think of yourself in a lowly way. This this is the irony of being a child of God. You are so elevated as to have the Trinity alive in you, and yet you have to think of yourself as lowly. By the way, this word that is used here a combination Greek word, tapeno frosune, 
a combined Greek word, appears nowhere in classical Greek. Can't find it in classical Greek. The only way it's ever been found is in the New Testament. Because the classical Greeks saw humility as a weakness, not something noble. John Wesley wrote, neither the Romans nor the Greeks had a word for humility. In secular literature, first couple of centuries A.D., humility, if it does appear in anywhere in the culture, appears as a weakness, to think lowly, to be weak, to be cowardly, to be faint-hearted, to have, uh, one uh, lexicon says, to have a servile mind. Pagans, as we would expect, because this is the, this is the default position of all fallen sinners, look on humility as a weak virtue, if a virtue at all. It's pitiful, pitiful. And that's why there's no word in classical Greek that would in any sense elevate humility. But God elevates it and calls not just for occasional humility or perhaps one or another kind of humility, but all humility, all humility. Total humility, nothing but humility. It's the basic position, the default position of sanctification. Start by humbling yourself. Now we have a, an incredible model for this. And not surprisingly, turn to Philippians 2. Paul says, make my joy complete. I want to stop right there. This is all he asks. His joy is complete at this point. He's not asking for a laundry list of things. Make my joy complete. This will do it. Be of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. In other words, live in the world in a way that reflects the image of God that you see even in the Trinity. The Father and the Son and the Spirit have the same mind, maintain the same love, are united and intent on one purpose. This is how the church is to live in the world. Let that invisible unity be visible. Now that's a challenge for us. So Paul comes back at us in verse 3 and tells us we have to say no to certain things. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Selflessness. This genuine spiritual unity cannot be made manifest unless we decide that we are going to be of the same mind, the same love, the same spirit, the same purpose. In other words, we get our theology together, and then that we live utterly selfless and unselfish lives. Somebody might say, well, for those of us who are elevated in Christ, this seems like going down pretty far. Well, I'll help you with that if you go to verse 5. Here's your model. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although He existed in the morphe of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. The eternal Son in the presence of the eternal Father, equal in every sense, eternally, did not hold on to that, verse 7, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a slave and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So if you're thinking it might be beneath you to humble yourself, you have to look at Jesus and see what He did. It is the greatest condescension, obviously, of all condescensions. It is incomprehensible to us to understand how far down He came because we can't comprehend how high He was. But he didn't hold on to it. 
He emptied Himself. He took on the form of a slave, made in the likeness of men, humbled Himself by being obedient, then humbled Himself to death, and then humbled Himself to the kind of death, even crucifixion, the most ignominious, brutal kind of death. So Jesus is your example of humility. For the purposes of God and to accomplish God's will, He humbled Himself. And then verse 9, for this reason also God highly exalted Him. Leave the exaltation to God, right? Isn't that what we know from what Scripture says? Humble yourselves and the Lord will what? Exalt you, lift you up. Jesus was an example of humility. He was acquainted with grief. He was hated without a cause. He had nowhere to lay His head. He was persecuted, betrayed, condemned, delivered up, despised, lifted up on a cross, mocked, numbered with criminals, killed. He did it all because it was the will of God and left Himself in God's hands and God highly exalted Him and gave Him a name above every name, that at the name Lord every knee would bow. Sanctification is a, is a battle for humility. You might even remember John the Baptist. About him, Jesus said he was the greatest man that ever lived. And yet he said about his Lord, he wasn't worthy to unstrap his sandal. And he said, I must decrease and he must increase. So sanctification, the pathway to sanctification is, is down. It's down. Humble yourself and the Lord will lift you up. And where His church is humble, it is united, and its love is manifest, and the world can see the power of Christ and the gospel. If the world is to believe that the Father sent the Son, it's going to be because the church manifests that power of the Father and the Son and the Spirit in making visible its invisible spiritual unity. It may seem obvious, but any meaningful study of the Bible begins with reading it. Many choose to read devotional material or books based on the Bible, but neglect reading the Bible itself. There is no supplement for reading Scripture. In his easy to read and brief booklet, How to Study Your Bible, Pastor John offers practical tips for how to understand and apply the life transforming truths of God's Word. This booklet is available to read online through our website free of charge or by purchasing a copy of it in booklet form by calling 888-57-GRACE or visiting gty.org. Discover the joy of unleashing God's truth in your own life and gain the confidence needed to effectively share the truth with others as well. On behalf of John MacArthur, thank you for opening God's Word with us today. We'll see you next time on Grace to You.